Okay, Mayor, I would like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And with that, I'd like to uh, call the, uh, is it October 14th, 2021, regular meeting of the Citrusite City Council to order. That, please call the roll. I, yeah, let's do the flag salute first. Would you please all rise and join me in saluting our flag? Congratulations to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, now we can call the roll. Council Member Bruins. Present. Council Member Daniels. Here. Council Member Schaefer. Here. Vice Mayor Middleton. Here. And Mayor Miller. Here. This meeting of the Citrus Heights City Council is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable systems. This meeting is closed captioned and live streamed at citrusheights.net. Tonight's meeting replays on Monday, October 18th at 9 a.m. on Channel 14. This meeting can also be viewed at uh, the city's YouTube channel. Then the next item is approval of agenda. I move approval. Second. Uh, second Mayor, by turn Schaefer. on your microphone. Thank you. Uh, motion by Bruins, seconded by uh, Middleton. And would you please call the roll? Councilmember Bruins. Aye. Councilmember Daniels. Aye. Councilmember Schaefer. Aye. Vice Mayor Middleton. Aye. And Mayor Miller. Aye. With that, on to the next item. Our next item is presentations. The first presentation, number four, is a proclamation of the City of Citrus Heights, recognizing Code Enforcement Officer Week. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to Chief Turcott to begin the uh, item. Very good. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Alex Turcott, you are Chief of Police. Um, here tonight, uh, we're here to recognize the awesome work of our Code Enforcement Officers. I've asked uh, Senior Code Enforcement Officer Deborah Nathan to take a minute to just describe uh, Code Enforcement Week and some of the, the great work that her unit does. So with that, Deborah, it's all yours. Thank you, Chief Turcott. Good evening, everyone. Mayor Miller, Vice Mayor Middleton, and council members. Uh, in 2018, California state legislators passed a resolution designating second week of October as Code Enforcement Appreciation Week. I would like to give you a, a brief description of who we are and what we do. Code enforcement investigates complaints received by the public for general blight, such as neglected landscaping, vehicle abatement, general nuisances, graffiti, dilapidated fencing, homeless camp, uh, homeless camp cleanups, hoarding abatement, and most importantly, the health and safety code as it relates to residential housing or commercial buildings. A large portion, portion of our job is education and making contact with the responsible parties for options or recommendations to achieve compliance. The mission and goal for our unit is to beautify the city, increase property values, invite new residents and business owners into our city, and provide a clean and safe environment for the, the citizens of Citrus Heights. During this special week, I would like to take a moment to, to thank each member of our code enforcement unit for their professionalism, hard work, passion, and dedication to the citizens of Citrus Heights. I'm extremely proud and grateful to each one of you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senior Code Enforcement Officer Nathan. And uh, I have a proclamation here I was going to present to uh, Sergeant Seth Semino. And in looking at it, it says just about everything that uh, uh, you reported on. Uh, so I'm going to uh, dispense with the reading and ask that uh, you find a nice frame for this and post it in a conspicuous location for everyone to see. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. 
much. Sir. Thank you, sir. Did you want to say anything? Okay, and I might as well stay down here for this one too. Uh, today we are proclaiming, and it's uh, we're a couple days late, but uh, didn't fall on a meeting date, October 3rd, 2021, as Seropinus International of Citrus Heights Day. So there's a bunch of whereases here, and it, it states that the Seropinus organization, founded on October 3rd, 1921, works to economically empower women and girls through access to education. The Citrus Heights Club was formed in 1973, and they've been an integral part of Citrus Heights for the past 48 years. Whereas the Seropinus of Citrus Heights has improved the lives of Citrus Heights women and girls by dispersing Seropinus Live, oh, Live Your Dream awards to local women to help them to get education and training they need to improve their employment process, pros, prospects and ec economic standing. Holding three Seropinus Dream It, be it events that have put 60 local girls on the path toward achieving their career goals. Working with local sex trafficking and domestic violence organizations, the Citrus Heights Police Department and Mercy San Juan Hospital to get women assistance with resources, both economic and personal needs to break free from their former lives. Partnering with Single Moms Strong, empowering single mothers and their children through varied programs by supplying funds and needed supplies and funding for routes and independent living programs at the Children Receiving Home of Sacramento. Now, therefore, be resolved that the City of Citrus Heights does hereby proclaim October 3rd, 2021, Seroptimist International of Citrus Heights Day throughout our city. And it's signed by myself and attested by the city clerk. And I'd like to ask Sandy from Seroptimist to come up and accept this. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I did want to ask you one question, Sandy. Okay. I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot because okay. <laughs> um, when does, and where does your club meet? We meet uh, the first and third Wednesdays of the month at Northridge Country Club. Oh, very good. Noon. Can anybody come? Yes. Can, can I come? <laughs> sure. Okay. We'd love to have you come. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be a woman. No. Oh, very good. <laughs> we have a couple of men. Okay. We have uh, two male members. Two male members. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come by and say hello. Okay, good. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And with that, and we'll move on to the next item. The next item is comments by council members and regional board updates. Okay, Tim, why don't you go ahead? Well, it's been a very, very busy couple of weeks here. Um, so first of all, I, um, I attended the California League of Cities, uh, also known or now known as Cal Cities. Um, and I'd like to congratulate our Vice Mayor Middleton uh, on her appointment to the Cal Cities Board of Directors. Uh, while at the conference on September 24th, I had uh, fourth, I attended some very interesting uh, study session on the 2020 census and the impact we'll have on redistricting. Uh, there are some very big changes coming our way uh, with regard to congressional districts. Uh, Citrus Heights grew less than the than estimated, and our uh, and our more minority uh, population shifted a bit. Um, I just kind of brought some notes here, uh, some interesting things to know. So. The 2019 estimate for our population was 87,796, but the actual uh, 2020 census brought in 87,583. So it, uh, we did not grow as much as we expected we were going to grow. Um, and the biggest shift was in uh, non-Hispanic, the non-Hispanic white population that grew from 16.5% uh, um, to 19.5%. So um, it's very interesting. The uh, I, I'm a numbers guy, um, and I just I'm fascinated when I can see, see all this information. It's really uh, really um, compelling for me, anyway. So, um, and um, 
So I had a library board meeting uh, that was um, where there was a presentation made. It was a little, it was kind of off a little off guard because uh, the Sylvan Oaks Library has a distinction of uh, having the most um, 122 incidents. That's the most by more than two times of vandalism and crime at the library. Uh, this is perpetrated primarily by the people living in and around the property. Um, and so um, that is a big concern. Uh, and we're hopefully we're going to work on some do, doing something with that. I did meet with the police chief and hopefully we can come up with some kind of reasonable resolution there. On uh, September 25th, which is the very next day, I attended the uh, grand opening of the Orangevale Library. I actually uh, signed up for a library board. I was stunned to see how many services, how, how many um, electronic services are available at the library. You can actually check out a Wi-Fi card. You can, um, they have um, essentially the equivalent of Audible. If anybody listens to books on tape or uh, streaming uh, books, uh, you can, um, there. it's all free. It's all, uh, just get a library card. I actually uh, got my library card while I was there. Um, and I, I, it's just amazing to me, all the services that are available there. You can stream movies uh, from the library. Uh, it is just uh, really uh, a remarkable uh, service there. Um, and I think about all the folks that can't afford to have internet at their house. Um, and, uh, and the library is a wonderful resource for them. So, and then on October 1st, uh, in Art of Manufacturing Day, and that's my chosen career is that uh, I'm in manufacturing. Uh, that is Manufacturing Day recognized nationally. Uh, and I attended this uh, Sacramento chapter of Society of, manufacturing, uh, Society of Manufacturing Excellence and their Manufacturing Expo. There were 52 exhibitors. This was done of all places. Uh, the initial plan was to uh, hold it in uh, at the McClellan Convention Center. Um, but because of COVID, we had to find an outdoor venue and uh, the city of Rancho Cordova was more than hospitable uh, for us to uh, lend us their parking lot. And we had small breakout sessions. One of the ones that was most interesting to me is, uh, is women in manufacturing. There are quite a, uh, uh, there's, there's quite a calling in manufacturing leadership by women. And, um, and that is something that, uh, that I'd like to see uh, younger women come into the manufacturing field. So uh, with that, that's a pretty busy time. So I'm going to turn it over to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Rachini, what have hey. you been up to? Thank you. Um, so I'd like to uh, note that I attended the uh, ceremony where we accepted five new members of our police department who took the oath of office, and I'd like to welcome them by name. The first one is Sheldon Hansen, who is a police officer followed by Samuel Hernandez, who's a reserve police officer level one, Regina Palomini, who's a police dispatcher two, and then two volunteers, Pamela Pelizari and Lilia Babchenik. So um, glad to see that the hiring efforts that we've been putting out are beginning to bring folks in to us. Uh, this week on Tuesday morning, I spoke to the local chapter of the Sacramento Association of Realtors um, I've had an invitation to do this every year, probably since 05, and my, October is my month, and I want to thank Megan Huber uh, for putting together some pre a presentation package for me, and they're always interested in knowing what's going on in Citrus Heights, so uh, as you can imagine, their, their top question is what's happening with the mall, so I saved the best for last and, and, and finished with that but also talked about the development we're, we're doing on Auburn Boulevard, the new housing uh, communities that are, are being built in Citrus Heights, and uh, they're always an engaging audience. So the, these realtors actually are uh, mainly selling in Citrus Heights, Orangevale, and Fair Oaks. And then our PAL board meeting happened yesterday. Um, we had a couple of events in, in September where we took kids. One was to a River Cats game. Uh, courtesy of uh, tickets from uh, supervisors who frost. And then we also took them to the air show. And so the kids loved it, of course, and we have more things coming down the pike. This month in October, we are doing trunk or treat again. 
It's actually two weeks from tonight. Uh, it starts at four in the afternoon and we've expanded it to a four hour event. And it's gonna include not only the police parking lot, but Dignity Health, because the response last year was so overwhelming that um, it was far greater than what we expected. I think the estimate was that over 2000 cars went through it. So this is a drive through event. So you don't have to leave your car. And um, we still, we've opened it up also last year, all the stations were, were um, manned by police officers and people from the police department. This year we've opened it up to the community and, and we've got Ascension Lutheran Church. We've got um, ARCA, the new um, uh, charter school, could say the word charter. And, and others, but we still have other openings. So if you are belong to a nonprofit or a group or a, a business, and you'd like to bring out your vehicle, decorate it, come out in um, some costuming, bring your candy. Um, we have baskets with long handles. So it's very COVID friendly. Um, it's a night that we are looking forward to in two weeks. Uh, let's see. Also just, uh, this is out in the future. But um, we are partnering, PAL is partnering with the Chamber of Commerce to bring back uh, the Cornhole Tournament. And that's going to be on February 18th at the Community Center. And that's open to the public. It's a fundraiser for PAL. And we did, we, we were probably the last event uh, in the Community Center in 2019 before COVID hit and shut everything down. And it was a blast. We had a great time, raised some money, it was great fellowship. And it introduced me to the world of Cornhole. Um, this, this Saturday, um, uh, the Halloween parade is, uh, being sponsored by the Citrus Heights Community Marching Band as they do every year. And so it starts at nine o'clock at, uh, Auburn Boulevard and Twin Oaks marches down to Rush Park where they host the Harvest Festival. There will be booths there, food, uh, PAL will have a booth there for people who want to sign their kids up for the PAL programs or just get information. And then um, we did have a, a sanitation board meeting this week too. Um, no, no hot topics, just continuing on um, our purple pipe program, which is the recycled water, which is being used for farming, um, parks, golf courses, and some other projects that are ongoing. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Fred. Oh, you guys are busy. No. Well, I got to check a whole bunch of things off my list, yeah. though. Um, <clears throat> so quite a few. I'm going to uh, just touch on the uh, what Jeannie mentioned, the mall. Um, I did have the uh, pleasure to get up to the mall over this last week. And um, it, it's it's just sad. It's sad. It, and something's got to happen now. Um, and so uh, I hope that uh, sooner than later we can move forward with what we hope to do with that mall because um, it's just... It, it's just terrible. Um, on the positive side, I was at the mall to go take some wonderful pictures with my my family and especially my beautiful little daughter who turned five. And I'm going to put a, a, a plug in for the people at uh, J.C. Penney's in their studio. Uh, couldn't have done a better job. Couldn't have spent more time with uh, us and especially trying to get a five year old to, to pose. Right. <laughs> and um, what a wonderful job and some incredible pictures. So that's the. Uh, positive shameless plug for them. Get out there and uh, spend some money if you get a chance. Um, yeah, in the audience, I see that we have the uh, esteemed uh, former council member, Al Fox. So I just wanted to say hello publicly and glad to see you here with us. A um, couple of things to go over uh, from the Air Board. I wanted to share that uh, there are a couple of programs out there for people who are interested in electric vehicles. The state offers a uh, up to uh, $7,000 for a purchase or lease of a new eligible zero emission or plug-in hybrid light duty vehicle. That is an after purchase rebate. And you can find out more information on that by going to cleanvehiclerebate.org slash ENG. And then on the local level, uh, the SAC Metro Air Board itself, the district uh, has a program called Clean Cars for All. It's even nicer. Uh, it, it allows up to $9,500 for the purchase or lease of a new or used electric vehicle. And that's an instant incentive towards the purchase price. So that's a pretty good program. Um, uh, the, the, the vehicle doesn't have to 
be valued at only up to 9,500. You can buy a $20,000 vehicle and get this applied. And so, there, I mean, there's obviously there's incomes and stuff like that that are in place. But if you're looking to make that uh, move, uh, you might want to look into that. And that one you can find, I would just refer you to the airquality.org uh, uh, website. It's uh, SAC Clean Cars for All, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff after it. But uh, take a look. And if you need that information and can't find it, go ahead and just uh, send me an email and, and I'll definitely uh, get it to you. All right, a couple of other things. Um, October 23rd, which I believe is a week from this Saturday, is National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. Um, it's where you can take the opportunity to get rid of your outdated or no longer used prescription medicine. And uh, typically we have a way to do that at the police department. And I was gonna ask the chief about that. I didn't get a chance. So maybe by the end of this meeting, if somebody knows if we're gonna have that available for people to uh, bring their prescription drugs down and drop them off at the police department. Additionally with that, um, a couple of years ago, I, uh, along with uh, the city provided some funding and supervisor Sue Frost helped out and we purchased uh, some of these locking prescription bottles. Um, I still have a few of those left. And if you would like one, it's a combination lock kind of a thing. And it's a great thing to have around your house if you have children and especially if you have teenagers. Um, there, I can't tell you how many horror stories I've heard about kids that, you know, you hear that, well, my kid would never the story. Um, believe me, there's no kid that should that falls into my kid would never. It, it happens on in all aspects of life. So this is a way to just kind of put a little wall between that temptation, that first pill or whatever. Um, it's a cap that goes on the bottle and it locks. It's a great thing. So if you're interested in that, uh, please again, get a hold of me and, uh, and we'll get that to you. What else? Um, the Mosquito Vector Board or whatever they're called has recently told us that uh, not only wasps, but uh, invasive mosquitoes are hitting us. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> it's to be taken serious because we're going to see moisture now coming up. And if you can get rid of the moisture, get rid of it, you know, out of your yard, uh, whatever. Um, and if you're getting if you're getting any mosquito bites during the day, that should not happen. And you should call the uh, mosquito vector control people. Let them know that that's happening, um, and they'll get traps out there to see what's going on because they really have to jump on that. Um, it's not normal for our mosquitoes <laughs> to eat during the day. They eat at dawn and dusk. So um, if you have that happening, get a hold of them and let them know. I had the uh, honor to attend the Jean Duncan Memorial uh, recently and um, heard about this uh, wonderful woman who has had her hands in so many things, so many, 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 many things throughout the history of Citrus Heights. Um, and, um, and, and just, uh, you know, I've known Jean since I started here in politics back in 1998. Uh, when I would say that maybe our relationship was strained. <laughs> but over the years, it became much more mellow and, and wonderful. And um, so, uh, uh, but uh, what an incredible woman. Um, and unfortunately, that's two incredible women that we've, that we've lost recently that have had incredible impacts on Citrus Heights. Um, but uh, it was an honor to be able to, to be there and, and share in that. Um, this week is National Police Week, um, and uh, usually uh, that happens during the week of May 15th, but it got postponed, uh, like too many other things because of COVID. Um, National Police Week was established in 1962 by President Kennedy and a Congressional Joint Resolution to pay special recognition to our law enforcement heroes who have lost their lives in the line of duty while protecting you, me, and our families. And so especially this week, if you get that opportunity, um, uh, reach out to a police officer, thank them um, um, for what they do. Um, every day, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of police officers go to work and put their life on the line. And um, they don't know if they're going home. They don't know. And uh, too many of them don't go home. And there was a story just in this last week, man, of a kid, and just he's a kid. Um, first shift, first shift after becoming a police officer on his own. And he was killed, he was killed. And so it happens and it happens to, you know, rookies, it happens to older officers and it happens all the time and we don't even hear about it, which is really unfortunate because uh, we're not, America, as Americans, we're not aware of what our police officers are, are going through and there's too much negative um, information, negative media about them all the time when um, they're going through these things. 
And the final thing um, I wanted to do was take an opportunity uh, to address an issue that occurred a while back, that being uh, the censor by the city council um, towards me for sending an unwanted email to a person from my past. I've had some conversations recently with some people who were directly and indirectly involved or aware of that issue. I've listened to what they had to say about the situation. And while I did take the opportunity previously to apologize for any distress I caused the other person involved, what I didn't do at the time was reflect on any embarrassment or distress that I might have caused my fellow council members and the city. To be truthful, I felt like I was under a personal attack at the time, and my response was focused on what I think most people would find reasonable, and that was the personal side of it. In the process, I neglected to consider and address how the issue impacted my fellow council members and the city. So today, in addition to reiterating my apology to the other person involved, I want to express my apology to my fellow council members for any embarrassment, any distress I might have caused them um, in the matter. And while the email I sent was not nefarious, nor did it have any, any ill will, I do understand how something can have unintended consequences and I'm certainly sorry for that occurring in this matter. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Brett, appreciate that. And I would say my favorite time of year is when all the mosquitoes are dead. Yes. Um, Portia, what have you been up to? Okay, so um, along with council member Schaefer, I attended uh, Cal City's. I did a lot of the different workshops and learned a lot of stuff and just got a lot of ideas that I'm going to try and bring back to our community and discuss more in depth, you know, at a later date. It's a lot of stuff to process. Um, I also want to congratulate uh, the folks at the city who put together in partnership with the county, the flu shot clinic. It was really easy for me and my husband to go and get our flu shots. We didn't have to worry about, you know, making an appointment at Kaiser. And that was super helpful. And we saw a lot of our community and family friends that were out there too, getting their flu shots, and making sure they're staying healthy. And I, um, it must be something in the air about, you know, talking about Sunrise Mall. Uh, two weeks ago, I was uh, presented to a Builders and Business Coalition here regionally in um, the Sacramento region about the Sunrise Mall project and what things are on the horizon, how we're so excited about what's going to be happening in our city. And I also attended the Chamber's uh, career fair that was done in partnership with our PBID, and that was an amazing turnout. We had folks. 40 local employers come out and um, set up and take in applications. I believe our police department was there also. So it's really good to see that we're going out there and really trying to rehire and reactivate our econ local economy. And I also had a meeting with uh, SACOG uh, for our policy innovation committee meeting. Nothing exciting to report from there. We're still trying to wait to see how our transportation funding is going to come through from, you know, the federal government. Uh, but as soon as we know something, I'll be sharing it with you. Thank you, Portia. I guess it's my turn, and we usually don't go this long on council comments, but uh, if you'll uh, pardon me, I'm going to be a little long, too. Uh, Tuesday uh, morning, I had the honor and privilege of welcoming everybody to the Citrus Heights Police Department 15th Annual Honors and Awards Ceremony. Tim, I think you were there on Zoom. Um, yeah, great event. Uh, I hope that the uh, our local newspaper, The Sentinel, reports on it, some of the stories. I think I was tearing up by the end. This is pretty heartwarming. Uh, and very proud of our police department and their, and their efforts, and they revolved around life-saving. Uh, anyway, I, I won't go into all the details tonight. Um, Jeannie mentioned the parade at 9 a.m. We also have a huge volunteer event at 9 a.m. this Saturday. It's on the little parklet along uh, Greenback uh, that starts right at Parks Oaks Drive and runs along uh, Greenback there. Um, we're spreading bark and we need volunteers. It, it's from nine to noon. There'll be a little continental breakfast provided and pizza around noon. Um, so if you uh, don't like parades, please come help us spread some bark. Uh, if you do like parades, go watch the parade, then run over there and, and uh, give everybody, spell everybody that's been there working since nine. Um, one thing that didn't make presentations, and I'd like to proclaim that uh, this month is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and it's important that we give a voice to those who have experienced abuse in their relationships. Uh, the Department of Labor estimates that 1.3 million women and 835,000 men are victims of physical violence by a partner every year. 
Now this uh, domestic violence does not discriminate against age, gender, sexual orientation, or economic status. It's a pattern of abusive behavior in any intimate partner relationship that is used by one person to gain control or maintain power and control over another person. Domestic violence can be physical, emotional, financial, sexual, technological, and or spiritual. This can include any behaviors that intimidate, manipulate, humiliate, isolate, frighten, coerce, threaten, blame, or hurt or injure someone. To raise awareness and help prevent abuse, our Citrus Heights Police Department has an ongoing partnership with WEAVE, and together they work tirelessly to provide resources to victims and bring offenders to justice. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't report on our strategic planning workshop from September 21st. I promised our facilitator, Marilyn, I'd do this. And boy, she found out I didn't, I'd be in trouble. So here we go. Uh, first thing we do in our strategic plan is uh, our SWOT analysis, which is uh, we talk about our internal strengths, our internal weaknesses, external opportunities, and external threats. And we use this information to, to uh, put together our three-year goals. And these are um, not in priority order, but uh, we, we established five main goals, and that's maintain and enhance fiscal stability, maintain public infrastructure and enhance alternative modes of transportation, diversify for a resilient economy, sustain and preserve public safety, and enhance community vibrancy and engagement. So off of those goals, we always sit down and talk about um, tasks that can be accomplished to, for these goals in the next six months. They have to be, uh, oh, she uses the term smart. Strategic, measurable, help me out here. Attainable, uh, something, something. <laughs> we can track it and we can- <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've heard it for what, 17 years and the acronym. Uh, so we came up with uh, five, five goals under um, maintaining enhanced fiscal stability. And uh, I think the same number of goals for uh, public infrastructure. Uh, we have four um, goals for diversifying a resilient economy and Four and three for sustain and preserve public safety and three for enhance community vibrancy and engagement. Oh no, there's six for that one. Um, and so um, this is anything out of the ordinary, uh, not, not regular work. This is something we assign to staff and uh, for them to work on and again, report back to us. I'm not gonna read all the goals. We'd be here all night. Um, but I encourage you to go to our website and you can type in the search button strategic strategic uh, plan. And it's a second part that has all our goals on it or whatever, if you're interested. And I know, again, I mentioned the Sentinel before, they, they posted this as well. So uh, website, get all the information on this. I think it's very important that we do this kind of planning. Uh, so, so staff knows uh, the priorities of city council. And uh, it's, uh, I think, really works when you work that, uh, uh, that plan. And I think that's it for me. We can move on. Next item is public comment and members of the public may address the council on any agenda item of interest to the public and within the council's purview or on any agenda item before or during the council's consideration of the item. Speakers will be limited to three minutes each. If you wish to address the council during the meeting, please either complete a speaker identification sheet and give it to myself. And if you're participating via Zoom, use the raise hand function or star nine from a telephone to indicate your desire to speak. When your name is called, I will allow you to unmute your microphone to speak. Um, and I do not have any written public comment for this section of the agenda. I do have some written com public comment for item 14, um, which I'll read um, at that time. Um, and I do not see any raised hands at this time, and nor do I have any. Uh, speaker cards that have been submitted. Okay. Well, with that, then we'll move on to the next item. Next item is consent calendar items 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And I would just like to note on the um, item 6, the approval of a minutes, um, it was brought to our attention that there was a minor um, error to the September 9th City Council minutes. 
uh, for the consent calendar action. It incorrectly reflected the uh, roll call vote, which was unanimous. So we have corrected that. Oh, perfect. Okay, and with that, uh, I'd entertain a motion. Move approval of consent. I second. Motion by Bruins, seconded by Schaefer. Please call the roll. Councilmember Bruins. Aye. Councilmember Daniels. Aye. Councilmember Schaefer. Aye. Vice Mayor Middleton. Aye. And Mayor Miller. Aye. That passes unanimously. And the next item is public hearing, item number 13. The subject is amendments to master fee schedule. The recommendation is to adopt a resolution restating the city user fees to identify certain community development department fees, which were omitted from the master fee schedule. Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Bill Zanoni, Interim Administrative Services Director. The item before you this evening is consideration of an adjustment to the city's master fee schedule. Uh, the purpose of the master fee schedule is to consolidate all of the city's user fees into one document. Um, we found in going through the, the uh, current master fee schedule that there were several um, longstanding uh, fees in the building uh, division and planning division of the community development department that didn't make it into the uh, master fee schedule document that was approved. Uh, was compiled back in December of 2019. Um, the, the fees in the building and safety division include um, four permit fees for a rooftop photovoltaic systems. Um, and these have actually been in place since 2011. Um, and a, a permit and the range of those fees is $125 to $296. Um, and a permit fee of $112 for residential electric charging station. And that one has been um, in place since 2017. And one um, existing fee in the planning division, a planning zone check fee. Um, and these are all um, existing fees. There's, uh, they're not new. Um, it's not an, an recommended increase to a fee. We're just trying to get them everything into this document. And we think with this, we finally got everything. In fact, we've promised, we met with the finance committee several weeks ago and we promised the finance committee that this, this is the final cleanup piece. So um, the, the recommendation is that the city council um, open a public hearing, uh, receive uh, public comment, and then um, adopt a resolution uh, restating the city user fees and amending the, the master fee schedule. Questions from council? Before I open the, yeah. Okay. So I just, so, um, so th these are not new fees. These are, these not are new fees, fees that were, they're already recorded somewhere. They're, they're um, I'm curious what the process when, when we're reviewing the each department, well, maybe I'm not wrong about that, but I would assume that each department reviews their own fees and what they have in each one. And I'm just curious if we're, if each department is reviewing, how would you go about missing this? Cause this could potentially be a, a big deal to the, you know, to the schedule itself overall. So I'm just curious, how does, what's the process that, how does this process uh, get developed and what, how do we, uh, for the next time when we need to update them, which it's going to come. I just would like to see this, um, you know, because it, it seemed like just in recent memory that we did this before right. where we corrected one that was somewhere that were missed. And I'm just curious, what's the process? And do we have a, we have a remediation plan in place so we can say, okay, next time we're going to, we won't have to do this a couple of times. Sure, that's, that's a good question. Um, we, it, when we did the master fee schedule initially back in uh, 2019, the city hired a, a consulting firm, Matrix Consulting, that met with each one of the departments. Um, at that point in time, there was no comprehensive 
a repository for all of the city's fees. Each department had their own. Um, and so at that time, working with this uh, consulting firm, intent was to identify everything that was being charged, um, file it, present it to council, adjust those fees that needed to be adjusted and move forward. Um, at that time or subsequent to that time, we found several uh, fees that were missed. The last round where there were several in the police department, um, which you uh, approved back in June. Um, at, at, after that, we, um, we went through the, the schedule again um, and in talking, looking at what, comparing it to our, uh, our chart of accounts, our, the revenue that's coming in, we identified these, these fees. They're, they're small fees. They're, they're not charged a lot. Um, but what we did do is we did uh, send out a, a communication to all the departments asking them to confirm that what's in there is everything. Um, and we've got confirmation back. So this will be it. Um, and going forward, when we do update the fee schedule, we will do that again. Um, but this now matches everything that the city um, is charging for user fees. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. All right, and this is a public hearing, so I'm gonna open the public hearing and anybody wishing to speak on this topic may come to the podium now. I don't see anybody running up, so I'm gonna close the public hearing. And I don't see any raised oh, hands. thank you, I either. forget about the virtual part. Uh, no raised hands, then close the public hearing. What's the pleasure of the council? So I move approval of staff's recommendation to include these fees into our document. Second. Motion by Bruins, seconded by Daniels. Please call the roll. Councilmember Bruins. Aye. Councilmember Daniels. Aye. Councilmember Schaefer. Aye. Vice Mayor Middleton. Aye. Mayor Miller. Aye. I promise that's the last ones. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Next item, please. Next item is public hearing number 14. The subject is CARES Act Amendment number four to the 2020-2024 Consolidated Plan and 2020 Action Plan for Funding. Amendment one, number one to the 2021 Action Plan and draft 2022 Action Plan and funding allocations for the Community Development Block Grant Program. The recommendation is to hear public testimony and then continue final action until the October 28th City Council meeting. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Stephanie Potter. I am the Housing and Human Services Program Coordinator for the city. And tonight I'm here to cover three actions that are um, all related, but because of the administrative requirements for the CDBG program, um, we have to take them each as a separate amendment because they're each um, changing a different year's action plan. Um, so the first one that we'll be going over tonight is the fourth and um, probably final amendment to the um, CDBG CV funding action plan. Um, this is the funding that the city received as a one-time allocation, a little over $900,000 total um, to respond to the impacts of COVID. The second item that we'll be going over is an amendment to the 2021 budget and action plan. And this is to increase funding to the signalized intersection improvement project. And lastly, we will go over the draft 2022 action plan and associated allocations that were developed by the Quality of Life Committee. So first, I'm going to briefly go over ongoing activities, um, mainly in the 2021 plan year. Um, we'll go over the CARES Act funding and give you a summary of the awards you've already made and how much money we have remaining, and then also provide an estimate of the funding we expect to receive in the 2022 program year. As a reminder, we have to adopt our action plan 45 days before the start of our program year. Um, so we are adopting our action plan now, but we won't receive our actual allocation until um, you know, April or May, sometimes even June. So it just depends on when the federal budget is enacted. 
the request for 2022 CDBG public service funding um, and the remaining CV funding. Um, we'll go over all of the requests that we received. And then based on the requests we received, we'll um, outline the quality of life committee's recommendations for funding. And this is a public hearing. So after that um, is an opportunity to receive council feedback and also feedback from the public on the proposed allocations. And we will continue action until the meeting on October 28th, um, where we'll have the final adoption of that meeting. This is an overview of the services that the city council allocated funding to for the 2021 program year. And this is goes by the calendar year. So from January 1st to December 31st. And when we do our year end report in March, we will provide um, a really detailed summary of all of the activities. This is just a reminder um, of how much funding each of our organizations um, currently has right now for their annual funding. In addition to the public service funding, we also have capital projects that um, are continuing in the 2021 program year. Some of them will be continuing into next year. Um, the signalized intersection improvement project was already approved, um, but it turns out it is in a CDBG target area. And so the general services department would like to take the money that was going to go to the 2021 accessibility and drainage project and instead put that into um, increased funding for the signalized intersection improvement project. So that is one of the amendments um, that we're reviewing tonight. And then we have the park improvement. Um, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up real quick. So if we increase the funding to the signalized intersection improvement project, there still will be a remaining amount of funding left because there won't be a 2021 accessibility and drainage improvement project. So the general services department would like to take the remaining funding after they increase the signalized intersection project budget and put that toward the Greenback Lane Complete Streets project. And construction on that is planned for early 2022. And now moving on to the park improvement project. And um, this is a partnership with the Sunrise Recreation and Park District, um, where we funded capital improvements for parks in Citrus Heights, and they agreed to take over Sayonara Neighborhood Park and the associated um, responsibilities for maintenance and liability and risk and all of that um, fun stuff that comes attached. So they just completed the park improvement project at San Juan Park, um, and that was a total of $200,000. So the first project was the um, the playground replacement at Rush Park, and this completes our um, our commitment to them that for the three hundred thousand dollars in order for them to take ownership of the park, and they have already taken ownership um, of Sayonara Park. We also have the Critical Repair Grant Program, which we partner with Rebuilding Together on. Um, this was allocated as part of our twenty twenty one funding capital funding, um, and we provided grants up to $20,000 for low-income homeowners um, for essential home repairs. So someone who might not need a whole home loan um, to get their whole house fixed, but maybe they just have like one or two essential systems that need to be replaced. Um, that project has been going well and they've actually exhausted all of the funding. And then we also always have our housing repair loan program, um, which is funded on an ongoing basis basis by loan payments received from previous loans. Here's a picture of the restroom um, replacement project at San Juan Park. That is the new um, restroom that it's actually a modular building that they dropped in there. And um, they did plan, I don't know, it might already be finished, um, but they are gonna put the concrete work around the building, um, but it is already functional. As I mentioned, the Critical Repair Grant Program is a partnership with um, Rebuilding Together. So far, we've completed 14 projects um, and exhausted all of the funding. We still have a significant wait list, and then we also have an interest list of 60 plus people. These are some before and after shots of some of the projects we've completed. Um, 
a lot of the applicants are seniors and have um, accessibility uh, issues. And so getting in and out of the shower can be a real trip hazard. And so when we're able to, we can um, provide the funding to make a, a space where they can go in and out of the shower safely and provide them a seat where they can sit down. So it really makes a big difference in, in their everyday life and being able to maintain in their in staying in their home safely. This was a project where um, the woman who lived here, her windows were broken. Um, and so she had security concerns and she was actually sleeping on her couch because she was nervous someone was going to break in and she thought um, you know, if she, if she slept there, at least she'd be awakened when somebody came in. And it was really sad. And um, our code enforcement officers actually are the ones who referred her over to us. And we were really fortunate to be able to have the resources that the city council allocated um, in place to help her and replace all of her windows. Um, so now she can sleep safely in her bed at night. And she also has a much lower um, uh, bill from, from SMUD as well. We do um, a lot of HVAC replacements with this funding as well. We get a lot of those requests, particularly for mobile homes. And also roof replacements. Um, this is a photo of one of the roof replacements we recently completed. So now moving on to the CARES Act, um, also known as the CDBGCV funding for coronavirus funding. It was signed into law in March of 2020, and Citrus Heights received a little over 900000 The round one funding we've already allocated, and we've allocated almost all of the round three funding. Um, so tonight we're talking about the remainder of the round three funding. The very first amendment that we did to award funds um, from our CDBG CV allocation was in May of 2020, um, we created the Supplemental Navigator Fund, and we also um, allocated over $80,000 to our current CDBG grantees because they received um, such an increase in demand for services. So we just really wanted to help them meet that increased demand quickly. Um, and then in August of 2020, we allocated the remainder of the first round of funding to the Renters Helpline and the required match for the Great Plates program. In April of 2021, um, we it was determined that we didn't actually need to put the local match for, um, for the Great Plates program. So we reallocated that money over to the Supplemental Navigator Fund. And then we also allocated over $135,000 to those community support applicants who had CDBG eligible activities. And then tonight's proposed activity or proposed amendment, excuse me, um, is allocating the remainder of the CV three, the CV round three funding. Here's a, a snapshot of all the awards um, that you've allocated so far for the CV funding. Um, the Sunrise Christian Food Ministry received a round one award of 30,000 and then also uh, over $6,000 um, as a community support applicant who we transitioned to CDBG funding, um, we've received $30,000. Campus Life has received um, $15,000 in round one funding, and then they also received um, $15,000 in um, round three. The Supplemental Navigator Fund, uh, as I mentioned, $125,000 when we initially created it and then another 91,000 reallocated from Great Plates. The Runner's Helpline has received over $8,000, and then Single Mom Strong received $9,100 from um, their community support application. So there's two city-led projects um, that we are recommending funding. One of them is the Critical Repair Grant Program. Um, we partner with the, with the service providers, but um, the city is really, you know, can scale up or down these programs depending on our, our priorities. Um, and so the Supplemental Navigator Fund, we really fund this in two different ways. The first way is the contract with Sacramento Self-Help Housing. 
um, which is about $85,000 a year. And this is funded with CDBG, our annual funding, and then also our permanent local housing allocation, um, which is a new funding source. We used to fund it with um, partially general fund, but now we've moved it all over to grant funding. Um, so second, there's the supplemental navigator fund. This is the money that um, stays at the city, but the navigator has access to for things like emergency housing and essential services um, for the clients that our navigator is currently working with. We have about $90,000 remaining in our supplemental navigator fund. Um, and we currently have clients staying at the Ranch Motel, um, Grace House, which is a sober living house, and also Auburn Oaks um, on Sunrise. So it's been very successful. And I know the police department is um, going to do a comprehensive update um, in the near future. Stephanie, can I ask you a question real quick on that? Absolutely. Um, on the uh, emergency housing um, at the, the three locations, what's the typical stay? How long do they stay? Do you know? Well, they can't stay any more than six months because CDBG won't allow um, any more than six months. So it just kind of depends. Um, we've had a range. We've had we've had a range of uh, of time. Some people who will um, go through more quickly than others, um, but the maximum is six months. Okay, so you. All right, you're thank you. You're telling, as I understand it, you're saying that they can stay up to six months uh, at each of those at either of those locations up to. Yes. Is that typical? Do they stay that long? Do you know? Or is that a is that a question for our police department? Some of them have stayed that long, but not all of them do. So we have had some. For example, um, the ones who have stayed the longest are like the ones at Grace House. It's a sober living facility and it's only $600 a month for them to stay there. Um, and they, you know, generally use the whole time to really make sure that they're they're prepared and ready to go back into life. Um, right, okay. And, and then there might be people who, you know, are coming to the ranch motel. They usually don't stay as long. Um, like they might be on the wait list for permanent supportive housing or on their way somewhere else. And, and so we would generally put them probably at the ranch motel. That's the, the ranch motel is much more expensive too. That's correct. Than, yeah. Than Auburn Oaks. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So for 2022, we estimate that we will receive $600,000 total, um, which we have 20% of that funding can go to planning and administrative costs, 15% can go to public services, and the remainder can go to capital projects. The General Services Department has um, recommended using our capital funding for 2022 um, for the accessibility improvement improvements that are related to the 2022 residential street resurfacing project. We know that's a really big priority in the city. And so um, we use our CDBG funds in the census tracts that are eligible, um, which have a certain more than 51% low and moderate income households. So the total amount of CDBG funding that um, we're talking about when we're talking about the nonprofit allocations for 2022, we have $90,000 available in public service funding, and we have $327,000 available in CDBG CB round three funding. So that's strictly for nonprofits. We released a notice of funding opportunity, um, letting the public know that we did have an estimated $90,000 in um, 2022 funding and over $300,000 in CDBG CB funds. Um, Nicole and I held a funding assistance workshop and we had some pre-meetings with some potential applicants. Um, the applications were due on August 12th and we received eight total. Two of them were new requests. Um, the two that were new requests were Pride Industries, which is a new request, although um, they're formerly the Crossroads Sylvan Job Center. So we did kind of work with them before, but technically new. 
and then eco outperformance, which is a brand new request. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Nicole Piva, and she's going to go over all of the requests for 2022 and CDBG CD funding. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Good evening, Mayor Miller, Council Members, Nicole Piva with the Community Development Department. Thank you. So I'm, I'm excited here tonight to go over the public service applications that we received this year. Um, the first one being from Pride Industries. They've requested $20,000 in CDBG and a little over $61,000 in CV3 funding. They're proposing a workforce development program. And a little bit about their program, um, Pride Industries, like Stephanie mentioned, was formerly at Crossroads Sylvan Job Center. It's a local nonprofit with a mission to create employment for people with disabilities. The Youth Workforce Development Program will provide at-risk youth ages 16 to 24 uh, with employment, career development, education, and training resources based on the individual's need. Um, what they consider at risk youth would be a youth with a disability, foster youth, juvenile, homeless, or a youth experiencing homelessness. The grant funds will go towards targeted outreach of recruitment and provide intense case management for services. So their funding will go towards personnel costs and they will serve approximately 37 youth annually. Next slide. Um, Eco App Performance is also a new application that we received. Um, they're requesting 15,000 in CDBG and also 15,000 in CV3 funding. Their program is youth employment and education training. Um, a little bit about their um, program is Eco App Performance is a nonprofit and they would be providing employment training and educational services to low-income young adults. Um, this service is a brand new activity offered to um, Citrus Heights. The program currently has one employee providing the service and the location and acquisition of supplies for this program is pending um, due to other identified it, unidentified grant funding. The funds will go towards personnel costs, and they're proposing to serve at least 75 youth. Rebuilding together, they've requested 100,000 in CV funding. This is our critical home repair grant program that Stephanie went over with the photographs. Um, Rebuilding together has managed CDBG funds for many years. Um, for SHRA, which is Sacramento Housing Redevelopment Agency, and the city of Rancho Cordova. So they're proposing to provide the home safety modifications and essential repairs for eligible low-income home homeowners. And some of the photographs you saw earlier in the presentation are the essential repairs like the HVAC, roof replacement, windows. Um, properties that are eligible for improvement are single-family homes, half plexes, although they must be legally separated from an adjoining structure, condos and mobile homes. Um, rebuilding together, like we mentioned, does um, currently service our contract and we've completed 14 projects. So funding um, provided would be grants to approximately six to seven households. Campus Life Connection, they're requesting 15,000 in CDBG and 30,000 in CV3 funds. This is our Sayonara Center after school program. Um, the center was opened in 2004 and in 2011, the city built the new center where Campus Life operates the after school program. Um, grant funds will partially fund a free after school program that provides low income youth with activities. Um, this is just a small list of activities that they offer, um, some to mention or mentoring, tutoring, educational games, technology center, and um, a meal after school as well. Requesting CDBG funds to help cover personnel costs 
And the additional CV3 funding will go towards family dinners Monday through Friday and day trips for approximately 30 middle to high school students. And they will serve approximately 105 youth. Meals on Wheels, they're requesting a little over 16,000 in CDBG and a little over 22,000 in CV3 funds. This is our senior meal program. Uh, meals on Wheels has been providing um, meals for our seniors since 2010. Um, two parts of this program, the first one being the Congregate Nutrition Program. This is offered at Rush Park. Seniors 62 and over who need a nutritious meal can attend the cafe site at Rush Park Monday through Friday. Um, currently, the site is closed, um, but they do have an option for drive-through pickup. Home delivered meals, second part of the program. These are meals that are delivered to frail and homebound seniors. So they receive one hot nutritious meal Monday through Friday, or they can choose to receive five frozen meals one time per week. CDBG funds will go towards personnel costs, and they're also requesting the additional CV3 funds to serve an additional 8,000 meals during the year. They've seen with um, COVID, there's been an increase in meals, and each month they have an increase about 665 meals. So they'll serve approximately 284 seniors. Sunrise Christian Food Ministry, they're requesting 18,000 in CDBG and a little over 12 in CV3 funds. This is our emergency food closet. Sunrise Christian Food Ministry has been receiving CDBG funds since 2016. They provide an ongoing emergency food for the current and increasing number of low-income families, including seniors, children, and people that are experiencing homelessness. They are open five days a week, 1030 to 2, in the parking lot of Advent Lutheran Church. Um, all staff members are volunteered, so there are no paid staff members. They're requesting CDBG funds for food supplies, food and supplies, and the additional CV3 funds to meet the increasing demand of purchasing food, in addition to operate the drive-through service pickup to eliminate the direct contact. So they will serve approximately 7,000 individuals. Sacramento Self-Help Housing. This is our renter's helpline. They're requesting 23,000 in CDBG and 10,000 in CV. They're gonna provide a telephone and internet-based renter's helpline, as well as counseling, dis, um, dispute resolution, and fair housing services. This is an existing um, partnership countywide. So the city's share of um, this program is 23,403 in CDBG funds. This activity satisfies the city's obligation to affirmly further fair housing, which is required by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So their CDBG funds will go towards personnel costs and then the additional CV3 funds. They are requesting for a one-time update to the renter's helpline website um, to accommodate the additional demands of, of the impacts of COVID and they will serve approximately 425 households. Also, Sacramento Self-Help Housing offers the Citrus Heights Navigator Program, like Stephanie went over. Um, they are requesting 16,000 in CDBG and 100,000 in CB3 funds. Um, this contract is funded with a variety of source it, funding sources. Um, the Citrus Heights Navigator provides housing counseling services for those who are at risk of being homeless and Navigator services for those who are currently homeless. Um, we had mentioned that they were allocated $125,000 in CV1 funding to help with housing deposits, motel vouchers, and food for people experiencing homelessness. So their CDBG funds will go towards personnel costs and their CV3 funds, the 100,000 will go towards the supplementary navigator fund, which will go towards the housing deposits and motel vouchers and food for, for those that are experiencing 
the need. Um, approximately 112 households will be served. Thank you, I'll turn it back over to Stephanie. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so I got a bit ahead of myself and I skipped over a slide. I just wanted to recognize the Quality of Life Committee, um, which includes Vice Mayor Middleton and Council Member Bruins. Um, they met with staff and reviewed the applications for funding. Um, and based on, on their recommendations, we've prepared this draft. Um, uh, this draft budget for both the 2022 funding request and also the remaining CB3 funding. Um, anything can be changed by a majority council decision, but this is what the um, Quality of Life Committee has recommended with staff's input. Um, so we'll start off with Pride Industries and, um, you know, the Quality of Life Committee can feel free to step in um, and, you know, say anything that you would like to, but I'll just go over it quickly. Pride Industries requested um, $20,000 and from 2022 funding, we're recommending um, that we don't give them any funding through our annual funding, um, but that we do give them their entire CV3 request of $61,611. Um, this is really uh, an activity that was suited for CV funding, um, job, getting people back to work and um, mentoring, and it seemed like something that was a really good fit. Um, so um, that was why it was recommended for the CB3 funding. Um, and eco app performance, this is a new request. Um, while it seems like this activity could be eligible for CDBG funding, um, they the applicant didn't didn't really show that they were ready to proceed. Um, and so we offered um, technical assistance to further develop the application, but we feel like at this time, they're not ready um, to start the project on January 1st. And so the recommendation is to not provide them um, any funding at this time, but to continue and offer them technical assistance in the future. Stephanie, I'd also like to um, add to that, that we felt, um, they the services that they are offering uh, or proposing to offer duplicate what Pride Industries offers, and they of course their reputation is very solid. So we felt it was uh, money better spent allocating it to Pride Industries rather than um, Echo A Performance because they really don't have a location or a program ready, as you said, at this time, perhaps in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member Bruins, absolutely. So next we have uh, Campus Life Connection. They requested $15,000 from our 2022 funding. Uh, we generally do give them annual funding. Um, so we've actually recommended giving them more than they've requested because we know they'll put it to good use. Um, and there was some funding left over. So the Quality of Life Committee wanted to, um, you know, split it between those nonprofits who we know really um, provide essential services and, and can definitely always scale up to meet the need. Um, so their CV funding request was $30,000. Um, and the recommendation is almost $29,000. Um, we didn't have quite enough funding um, to split between everyone. So the Quality of Life Committee um, directed us to um, reduce things proportionately um, based on the amount of funding um, that we have left. So next we have um, Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels requested um, $16,640 um, because we have enough funding um, the, the recommendation is to give them their entire request um, and then to give them almost their entire request of um, $22,560 for CV3 funding. Um, the Sacramento Self-Help Housing, so we have the two um, parts of this program that we fund, the annual funding for the personnel costs, um, which is $16,000, and this is part of the contract that we have. Um, and so we would have to supplement this with another funding source if we didn't fund it fully. Um, and then 
$100,000 was the request for the Supplemental Navigator Fund. And based on the amount of funding available, the recommendation is um, about $96,000. So the Runners Helpline, um, this is, as Nicole mentioned, the city's, um, how the city satisfies its obligation um, by HUD to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, this is part of a regional contract, and this is another one of our activities that if we don't fund with um, CDBG, we would have to make up the funding elsewhere. Um, so for that reason, we recommended funding it um, at its requested amount. Um, and then also the share of the increased services to meet with the um, demand from COVID. The Sunrise Christian Food Ministry um, requested $18,000 in annual funding, um, and we were able to give them their request and a little extra um, like the others. And then also um, the CV3 request, um, we were able to almost give them the entire request, but um, those ones we had to proportionately scale down a little bit. So lastly, we have Rebuilding Together, the Critical Repair Grant Program. And this one um, is a city-led program, and so we can really um, scale it to meet our needs, knowing that we have a lot of demand for both this program and also the Navigator Fund. Um, the decision was made to, to split the difference between the two. And so the recommended funding amount for the Critical Repair Grant program is $96,445. I think I got that right, sorry, it's a lot of fours. Um, so these are the recommendations. If the Quality of Life Committee would like to add anything, they're welcome to. Um, and I'm also available to answer any questions. I'll just comment and say that every year this is um, a difficult task because we always have more requests than we have money to give. I just I think that this year we were able to come really close um, uh, to the request with the CV3 funding, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I want to thank Stephanie for the hard work she does on this every year, and and I, I feel comfortable with. Uh, bringing this recommendation forward to the full city council um, and we're happy to also answer any questions you might have. Were there any questions before I open the public hearing? Thank you, uh, Stephanie and Nicole, for a very thorough report. And with that, I will open the public hearing. And anyone here wishing to speak on the item, please come forward. Um, don't see anybody. Uh, we have three written. Do we have any hands up? I don't see any hands raised. Go ahead with the written comments, please. So I'll go ahead and begin the written. The first one, this past year at the Sayonara Center, we have been able to create lifelong memories with our students. Adjusting to what was best and safest for our students and their families during the pandemic was a challenge we were up for. We were able to serve around 13,000 meals for our little kitchen to our students, their families, and our Sayonara neighbors. For a few months, we created an outdoor computer lab for students to come receive help with their homework before moving back indoors. Outdoor activities and day trips created new experiences and fun adventures for us, such as boating at Rollins Lake, day trips to Tahoe, Capitola, Six Flags, swimming and lake day with Pal, the beach and more. We had five students graduate high school this past June and three of them were accepted and started at San Jose State, UC Davis and Sac State. We are so proud of them. We have been able to bring back most of our programming as we have been open Monday through Friday to our students since August. It has been great being all back together. Thank you Citrus Heights City Council for your ongoing faithful support of our program, the Citrus Heights Police Department the city's personnel and other agencies in this community make our efforts possible. We are thankful and proud to be a part of this Citrus Heights family. And that was from Julie Habib with the Sayonara Center. Next, uh, Scott Young with the Sacramento Self-Help Housing. Sacramento Self-Help Housing is pleased with the recommended CDBG funding, which continues to support our Homeless Outreach Navigator Program. In addition, the recommended CV3 funding will allow Sacramento Self-Help Housing and the City of Citrus Heights to continue a successful collaboration that has helped get many of Citrus Heights' homeless residents off the streets and into shelter and transitional housing. We strongly urge the City Council adopt, to adopt the final recommendation. 
Next from Rocky Peterson with Sunrise Christian Food Ministry. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to address you concerning 2022 funding of CDBG. Sunrise Christian Food Ministry is still in the business of distributing emergency food to the needy in our city. We have been doing the work for 39 years, but now the work has increased significantly during the COVID-19 crisis. Instead of having clients come for food at once every 30 days, we have changed the policy to coming when needed. Part of the reason for the change is we are the only operating food closet in our area. We used to share the work with others, but they all remain closed at this time. Also, we are the only agency in our half of the county who distribute food five days a week. The new policy has increased the number of people we will serve this year and will exceed 75,000. Um, and then he did provide an attachment, but we can share with this council. Um, that means increased food supplies with increased costs and additional work for all of our volunteers. So we thank you for considering us in allocation of the CDBG funds to help enable us to serve our community. And the last written comment from Linda Revilla with Meals on Wheels ACC. Meals on Wheels is appreciative of our partnership with Citrus Heights to provide food to senior residents. Last year, we delivered 28,414 meals to 216 homebound residents. When our congregate program at Rush Park closed in March, we pivoted to delivering meals to those participants and new enrollees for a total of 8,499 meals to 133 unduplicated City of Citrus Heights residents. The grand total was 36,913 meals to 349 Citrus Heights residents. And it looks like I do have one uh, raised hand. Um, so I'll go ahead and call on them. Um, Andrea Rogozniski, and I apologize if I mispronounce that. Um, we will give you three minutes to speak. You can now unmute yourself to speak. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, lovely. Uh, good evening. My name is Andrea Rogozinski from Pride Industries. Um, and I'm here with you with a few other members of our team uh, representing both um, Michael Ziegler Pride Industries Foundation and also other members of our Job Center team, which is located on Sylvan Road and Auburn, at the Auburn Road intersection. Um, our proposal for the Youth Workforce Development Program, which will expand access to workforce education and training services at the Job Center in Citrus Heights for youth with disabilities or other barriers to employment, has intensive case management services that will provide directly, that will provide, excuse me, directly responds to the need to connect youth to employment and work experiences, especially in the wake of economic and social impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. The requested funds will resource direct staff time in providing one-on-one -on -one intensive support to at-risk youth ages 16 to 24 with work readiness supports like career exploration, employment preparation, assessments, resume development, job or interim placement assistance, and retention support. And lastly, we wanted to mention that direct case management dollars allows us actually to leverage private foundation resources to further create career pathways for those we serve. So the Mike Ziegler Pride Foundation will provide access to over $45,000 in wages and support services for pay, paid internships within Pride Industries for up to 250 hours at current minimum wage um, for each youth that we place. Um, alternatively, if youth is placed in, permanent, in a permanent position, we'll be able to work with the employer to subsidize wages during that training period. So we'll have these direct um, dollars to be able to provide intensive case management and then we'll be able to provide the dollars for wages to get them started and supported in an, either an internship or in a permanent position. So we're excited about the impact of this program that we'll have um, and to support our youth that we serve and we appreciate your consideration and support. Thank you very much.
Anything on the comments? Yes, uh, that is the end of public comments. I do not see any more raised hands. Thank you everyone for your comments. And with that, I will close the public hearing. And uh, Ryan, do we need a motion to continue final action? Uh, yeah, that'd be a good idea. Okay. We'll entertain such motion. I move that we um, approve calendaring this for the final action. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, date certain is October 28th. Yeah, okay, do October 28th. Second. Motion by Bruins, seconded by Daniels. Please call the roll. Council Member Bruins. Aye. Council Member Daniels. Aye. Council Member Schaefer. Aye. Vice Mayor Middleton. Aye. And Mayor Miller. Aye. The next item is department reports, and I have none. The next item is city manager items. No, not this evening. Thank you. The next item is items requested by council members or future agenda items. Anything for oh, go ahead. Yeah, a couple things. Um, I want to see if we can bring a couple things back uh, for the agenda. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just, uh, and, and I'm not talking on the matter. I'm just giving a little bit of a prelude about what I'm talking about. Um, you know, I talked a little early about Gene Duncan and the memorial and uh, Gene and Jack have been an integral part of Citrus Heights, uh, the success of Citrus Heights. And um, after listening to the former city manager, Henry Tingle at Gene's Memorial, it is clear the community center would not be what it is today without Gene Duncan. And uh, so, there may be some guideline hoops we have to jump through to get there, but I would like to request uh, two of my fellow council members join me in uh, asking that we bring back an agenda item to consider a resolution to rename the community center, uh, the Jack and Jean Duncan Community Center. No, he uh, donated the fountain there and he goes by and cleans out all the money. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Henry did before he retired. <laughs> That's anyway, um, we got. Uh, for that yeah, absolutely i'd second that um, i'd be willing to talk about it i'm yeah it was, bring it back it, to talk that's about a tough it. part about this is surprise but uh, i think the yeah let's talk about it um and uh so you got your third okay. and then the other thing is uh you know heavily in the uh the world today is uh the COVID issue and with that comes the the vaccine issue mass issues and stuff like that Again, I want to see if I can get two of my fellow council members to join me to bring back an agenda item to consider a uh, resolution prohibiting any vaccine mandate for city employees, prohibiting vaccine passports anywhere in the city, opposing vaccine mandates in schools, and opposing mask mandates, uh, excuse me, mask mandates in schools. Well, um, I'd like to speak to that. I am um, in favor of choice. And so I would uh, like to see a resolution that was worded that would allow choice uh, in regard to the vaccine and not any mandates for staff or any of our business community. That's, I would support that. I would also support that. So if I... and just, just to chime in on there, obviously there are a number of legal issues associated with that that I'll, I'll need to research or look into before our, our next meeting or whenever we're gonna discuss that next. Thank you. And I would think a couple of things you mentioned, like schools is not in our purview, really. So and that's why I just said opposing. I, I didn't say got it. Um, got it. You know, prohibiting or, or yeah. anything else. Me. Right. Is there any other business we need to take care of, Amy? I do not have any other items now. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>